Well, ministers are still under sustained pressure over the provision of PPE, that is personal protective equipment, uh, to frontline health and care workers. The Health Secretary for England, Matt Hancock, denied reports that the UK had refused for political reasons to take part in a European Union scheme to secure supplies of some essential equipment. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has the story. But as you can see, my machines sit idle and our staff are furloughed. Empty workshops that don't have to be. Tomorrow, Jim Griffin's car parts firm will start up again to make gear for medics. He'll repurpose his kit to make protective equipment. But although he says he's filled in form after form, this Nottinghamshire factory will be making medical equipment for orders from Ireland. I don't understand why it's so difficult for people to be getting in touch with companies like ours to make the products here in the UK. MPs are now back at work in a very different parliament. And the squeeze on equipment for health workers is top of many of their demands. The green benches have been carefully spaced out. Order! Order. From tomorrow, they will be able to ask questions of ministers online. Members may launch forth into fine perorations only to be muted or snatched away altogether by an itinerant internet connection. Ministers defend themselves to MPs and others by saying they're focusing on larger providers after a vast 8,000 firms offered to help with kit. But the opposition believes the government has had time enough. Manufacturers here saying, look, we stepped up, we offered, uh, we didn't really hear back from the government, um, and yet at the same time we've got um, planes trying to bring stuff back from abroad. So something's clearly going wrong. Do you think this is a bit of a reflection of what's going on in a wider sense in terms of the management of this crisis. The other decisions about testing, about equipment, um, appear to have been very, very challenging for the government and I think they've been slow into it um, and they're still not fully accepting the gap between what they say or think is happening and what the front line are telling us is happening. The Health Secretary has always said the government was well prepared to cope with the terrible reality of this crisis. Since the start of the crisis, we've now delivered over a billion items of PPE. We're constantly working to improve that delivery system, buying PPE from around the world and working to make more here at home. This was declared a pandemic well over a month ago. Why is the government still having to scramble now to get our health workers the equipment they need and allowing UK firms we've been hearing from today who could supply British hospitals and care homes to sell their products abroad? I think the most important thing that we concentrate on is what are the offers that can get us the most PPE to be able to get it into the country, to be able to manufacture it here and to be able to then get it out to the front line. And we're doing everything we possibly can to make that happen. But tomorrow, ministers will no doubt again be asked in this very different looking parliament whether doing everything they can is the same as achieving what needs to be done. Well, let's go live to Westminster and Laura is there for us. And Laura, tonight we have a situation where a senior civil servant is withdrawing remarks that he'd made about the government's handling of this crisis. That's right, Hugh, and it's a very unusual situation. Viewers might remember at the start of all of this, the government came under quite a lot of flack for not taking part in an EU-wide scheme to bulk buy lots of the kinds of equipment that we might need in this crisis as it was unfolding. They said at the time there'd been a bit of a mix-up, emails had gone to the wrong addresses, and they insisted it was absolutely nothing to do with ideology. Remember, this was just happening around the time when we just left the European Union, and they were insistent this was not political. But then today, Sir Simon MacDonald, who's just about as senior as you can get round here in the civil service, said something completely different. He said that there had been a political decision, but then was almost immediately contradicted by the health secretary, Matt Hancock, who said that wasn't the case. And then tonight, then this very unusual retraction from someone like that official saying there'd been a misunderstanding and he was wrong. Now, this is more than a matter of just he said, she said, and it's quite hard to get to the bottom of exactly what happened in this specific issue. But it is another reminder that on this specific question of making sure that medics and people working in care homes have the right kit that is
is vital to dealing with this crisis. The government is encountering, encountering lots and lots of rocks in the road. And I'm sure that this is something when the first prime minister's questions in this strange new parliament that's gradually returning will be something that will certainly come up from MPs, perhaps on the Tory benches, as well as from the opposition. This is an important and difficult issue. And no one really expects the government to fix it overnight, even though there's no question they're working very hard to try to do so. Laura, many thanks again. Laura Kinsberg there with the latest at Westminster. Well, for weeks now, health experts have been emphasising the importance of boosting the capacity to test people for coronavirus. The government's target for the UK of 100,000 tests a day by the end of this month is widely regarded now as unrealistic. Current testing levels are nowhere near that figure, but home testing kits are now being given to some key workers, as our health editor Hugh Pym explains. Des is a prison officer on his way into a drive through coronavirus testing centre. Window down now, yeah? As a key worker, he can, in agreement with his employer, get a test to confirm whether he's fit to stay at work or return from self isolation. I'm going to get you to say R ah, and just try a continuous R ah for me. That's really good to do. A simple throat and nasal swab and the job's done. He has to wait a couple of days for the results to come back. Thank you. Well, I was coughing at work and uh, my colleagues didn't want to work with me. Uh, which is fair enough. Some of the uh, prisoners as well were thinking, whoa, hang on. <laughs> so, yeah, I was uh, sent home and uh, sent down here, which I think is fair enough. There's a network of testing centres for key workers like this around England and a similar drive-through site near Aberdeen Airport. And home testing has started this week in England, allowing key workers to take their own swab samples and send them off for analysis. The number of tests carried out each day on patients and essential staff has risen to around the 20,000 level since data was first available earlier this month. But that's still well short of a government target of 100,000 tests a day by the end of April, less than two weeks away. That target, set by the Health Secretary Matt Hancock, is for the number of tests carried out. Testing capacity is another matter. Facilities like this can be set up, which aren't fully used. The real aim is to secure the testing capability that the country needs and I'm confident that we have that and we'll be able to allow the country to respond with the testing that is required. Are you confident you can get to the 100,000 tests a day level by the end of April? Well you need to talk to Secretary of State about his target but we are confident that we have the lab capacity to deliver the testing, uh, the testing service that the country needs. The swabs are brought here to one of three so-called mega labs. This one in Milton Keynes has been created at an existing research centre. Management here got a call in late March saying they were going to be part of a national virus testing effort. Equipment was lent by laboratories all around the country. It was brought here by the army, the navy and even in cabs. Testing started a few days later. Soon they'll move up to a 24-7 operation. The manual process at the moment will support many thousands of samples a day and as the automation develops then that's going to rapidly escalate into tens and tens of thousands of samples a day. Those tens of thousands will be part of the move towards the government target with volunteers like Beth who's a research student helping out. It's really nice, it's really rewarding to be able to contribute. I've got a lot of friends who are on the front line in healthcare professionals and to be able to contribute and help them out in a way um, is good. Overall, there's a drive to escalate testing capacity, which will be crucial if there's a second spike in cases later in the year. Whether it's all enough to hit the government's target this month is another matter. And Hugh was with me now. There was talk at the official briefing today of a vaccine. Um, how do you assess the prospects for that? Well, Hugh, in the long run, a vaccine is the way out of all this. And the two interesting looking trials in the UK, one at Imperial College London, the other at the University of Oxford. In fact, the Oxford trial is due to start this week, probably on Thursday, involving 500 volunteers. Now, Matt Hancock, the health secretary, said today he was going to fund these to allow them to start manufacturing doses in September if they were successful, allowing further trials. So what's the long run chance of success? Well, experts have always said it'll take time. It won't be till the middle of next year at the earliest you get anything at scale in terms of a vaccine, but that'll all depend on the success or otherwise of trials like these. Hugh, once again, thanks very much.